I'm Jeremy Morsch, uh, Consul General of Germany, and um, I am the co-host uh, of this uh, wonderful event. Uh, I'm really glad that we have such a great turnout uh, to all the time. Um, we have gathered to uh, somehow raise the level of awareness or go into in-depth uh, discussion about uh, climate change, a truly global issue of great importance, and I'm very grateful that you all have found the time to come here and join us. Uh, this is just the beginning of uh, several events uh, in this context, so we will be continuing this series and we will be happy to see uh, you in the following year again. Thank you. Um, Tara, the Human Impacts Institute, uh, and the uh, German uh, Embassy in Washington, D.C., our friends and colleagues, um, for um, making this event possible. I'll not say anything more, to, not to take away the substance of this short meeting. So um, uh, let me just remind everybody that this is part of a longer process uh, in the context of the um, climate bridge uh, between Europe and uh, the United States, the Atlantic Climate Bridge, and uh, uh, we are fully aware that it is especially that dialogue between Europe and the United States, transatlantic dialogue, that is crucial to bring us forward in this discussion, and um, I wish you a fruitful and interesting evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
impact is our tie, our um, the way to tag us at the Human Impact Institute, and the hashtag is Human Impact Miami. Um, so feel free to join in the conversation that way. <coughs> so my first question is: We have that little oh. overview video here in Miami. When we think Miami, it's I, I think all the beaches and salsa and all sorts of fun stuff. But that video wasn't super fun. So I, I actually want to start with: What are we really risking? What, what is the risk going on? And for that, if we could start with Jason. When we look at Miami and we look at these um, amazing buildings everywhere, this is a Miami um, after Hurricane Irma in 2005. And, and this was uh, someone's house, was apparently right there. Um, and this was actually in Rolling Stone. It was a very long article recently about Miami. And Jason, I'm wondering, what are we risking when we look at buildings and infrastructure here? And if you could grab the mic from Jess. Well, I think uh, I think the images that you're showing are pretty uh, are pretty compelling. Uh, they're really at the root of the problem is uh, is obviously the infrastructure. Now, there's the first real I guess real step that needs to take place is what do we do about our infrastructure to, to help improve moving out some of the, the water. The, the water table actually is, is about one or two feet from uh, from the ground plane. So. Uh, that's why you don't see, uh, you know, basements and a lot of subterranean structures because it's, uh, it's very expensive. So from the, the first, I think, method of mitigation is, is improving the infrastructure in, uh, in the downtown areas and the areas that are really going to be affected. The next, I think, uh, I guess, step that the city can begin to take is, is forcing a lot of the, the homeowners, developers, and, and other people who are engaged in the building industry to address the floor level, you know, minimum floor levels that the ground plane is built at. So you, what you're beginning to see in the city of Miami Beach uh, and then also in the city of Miami is, is that they require the ground level to be a certain number of inches above the crest or the crown of the street. So that's something that the city is trying to do by saying, hey, you need to be at least 24, 36 inches above the crown of the street. And then at least we know that we have 30, 40, 50 years of viable architecture uh, to help uh, you know, create a, a city around those zoning codes and those requirements. So those are some of the, the, the I think, the first steps that the city has begun to take. Great, so sea level rise is certainly a huge part in terms of infrastructure. And I wonder, um, Jess, if I could come to you next, um, because it's, all, it's not always what we're actually risking, but also what we perceive to be risking. So I'm wondering, I have this up here, objective risk is not equal to subjective risk. Can you tell me what that means? Sure, so um, objective risk is pretty straightforward. It's quantifiable risk. Um, insurers will talk about objective risk. It's basically, you know, you can use a simple calculation to figure it out. It's not simple, but it's, um, you know, exposure times the possible loss, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. When we talk about subjective risk, it's a very different story. Um, subjective risk differs across individuals. You know, we up here even might have very different um, perceptions of what that risk looks like. So this is perception-based. Um, it comes from personal experience. And um, this is why, one of the reasons why, um, when we talk about subjective risk in terms of climate change, it's a difficult thing to, um, to think about because it, when you, when you, if you think that it needs to have uh, some kind of personal experience to have a greater sort of perception of risk in terms of climate change, we don't really necessarily connect to um, experiences from climate change. We haven't had personal experience that we call climate change. So our risk perception might be lower than it actually is. Um, and uh, subjective risk is important because it motivates worry and worry motivates support of policy and behavior. And so when we think of uh, you know, how we all respond to climate change, we have to think about how individuals will, will sort of assess their own personal risks. Right. And you are just to get us to start us off with a little bit of international perspective, when we're not just looking at Miami, what are we looking when we talk about climate change on a, on a broader, more global level? Well, first of all, in like a minute. <laughs> Well, from an international case, from a global uh, perspective, is uh, we'd be expecting a more extreme weather um, events than uh, for sea level rise affects uh, more and more people because there's a tendency of more people living in coastlines. 
So if we could go on, I asked you the question of what word comes to mind with climate change. So now I'm going to ask you guys another one. What image pops into your head when you think climate change? Permafrost. Permafrost. Right here in Miami. Well, it's going to kill us in Miami. <laughs> yeah, permafrost is a good one. Who else? Underwater. Underwater. Uh, Philippines. Philippines. Yes, very recently we've seen it's an example of extreme storms in the Philippines. Republicans. What does that look like? Flooding. Sorry, I stole that from you. Yeah, come back. Yes, I'm from, I, did, I represent the crowd because I'm concerned about what we're doing here with the trees. The trees, the image of the trees coming to mind. Here one more. Immigration. Immigration. Great. Great. So, about so, fresh water. Fresh water as well. So these are all things that, that when, when we're talking, we're going to get to this in a minute, but we're talking about the objective versus subjective risk, because those images can be very powerful for us in decision making. And I have a little, uh, another little source of inspiration to really see how does this idea of how we perceive risk impact our decision making. And here's Anthony Leserwitz from the Yale Project on Climate Change. So just say a little bit about it where we have great trouble as societies and as individuals making decisions is on those things that we're not really sure what's going to happen. And we have to somehow reach a conclusion. Now, that doesn't mean, however, that we do that in a quote-unquote rational, deliberate fashion. There's a lot of different ways that we make decisions, uh, ranging from evacuation behavior in a hurricane to decisions about what kinds of policies we want to support for climate change, to what kinds of decisions, who you're going to vote for for president. All of these are, are calculated decisions. You know, if you're trying to talk and educate people about a hazard, then it's obviously very important that you understand what they currently understand about that hazard. And that isn't just simply their, the knowledge that they have about that hazard, but how do they feel about that hazard? Um, what kinds of images come to their mind when they think about that hazard? Because in most cases, for most hazards that we deal with, people's actual factual knowledge about them is relatively limited. And so they're drawing on other sources of information that they hold in their minds, as well as from around the people around them. So, so believe it or not, a little summary of Anthony is, is that word that you wrote right when you came in, not emotion? Apparently it has a lot to do with how we make decisions. Um, so I'm wondering, actually, Xavier, if, if you've worked a lot with a lot of different communities here, um, what sort of, you know, what are some of the emotional reactions that, that you've heard when you're when you're talking about climate in the communities here? Well, my effort is to try to find ways of having people connect to one another and to the natural world. And um, for anything, what I try to do is engage in discovery. Right? It, it's um, it's about trying to figure out how they're connected to their natural environment and to try to find beauty in it. And um, in a sense, it's building these constituencies of compassion, these people who are so enamored with the natural beauty that surrounds them that they don't have to um, look at statistics to visualize their importance. And in many ways, it's about getting fingers and fingernails dirty uh, with soil of a tree or a plant or someone 20 years from now. It's about processes and activities that make you a more engaged citizen, that make you more caring. And by doing that, not only do we care for our future vis-a-vis -vis the climate, but about our future vis-a-vis -vis all of our social issues. And if we can begin to engage in a conversation where climate is as important as education, as important as economy, and we're in this all together, then I think we're in the right, in the right track. And that's what all these art projects that I've created with local museums and with Catalino are about. It's about engaging people to literally become their own activist. Great. And Jess, we have this question up here. How does this perception of risk and, and you know, if Xavier is on the ground really getting people to take action and, and to feel emotionally connected, but coming back to risk and this idea of, oh gosh, bad stuff might just be happening locally or globally. How does that perception change how we make decisions? Um, well, so there's a couple things that I'm thinking about. 
are thinking about um, emotional appeals, um, the type of things that can happen and how these can impact our behaviors. Um, so one is this emotional numbness that can happen. Another possible response is um, this idea that there's this uh, limited pool of worry that we all have. And um, climate change ranks very low on uh, people's list of worries. I think the Pew Center did a study this year that showed, you know, even though people are aware of climate change and are more and more believing um, it's happening, despite you know many efforts to combat that, um, that out of 21 policy issues, climate change action is the last that people support. So um, you know the, there's a, a finite capacity to worry about things that we all have, and so. Um, you know, climate change might move up and down on that scale, but it's usually pretty low. Um, and the last thing that I'm thinking about is this sort of, when we appeal to our, our, our emotions, another response is this sort of single action bias that can happen that people then, uh, you know, are so worried, but they take one action and then they sort of, it reduces the worry and they say, oh, I can kind of step back and breathe aside side relief. How many of you have done that ever in your lives? Like, how many of you have changed a light bulb uh, to, a, to a complex fluorescent light bulb? You're like, I do a little something. Yeah, or how many of you turn off your computer at night? Okay, how many of you have actually changed all the appliances in your home to be energy smart appliances? And how about buy a, a more energy, a more uh, environmentally friendly car? Oh, wow, this crowd is probably not. You guys are awesome. But, so there's not, still more, yeah, there's still more. <laughs> Um, you guys remember Fukushima? What happened in nuclear energy? Um, so there was this um, nuclear meltdown in Fukushima, and you can see the nuclear fallout was, was big, but it was in um, Asia. Um, and we see here Standard and Poor's, which is looking at the financial situation in terms of the red line on the bottom is looking at nuclear um, and kind of the, the value of nuclear um, energy, so the clean energy, uh, nuclear energy index, I'm sorry. And the top green line is the clean energy index. And you see where those two lines divide? That's right the day that Fukushima happened. So we saw some economic impacts. But Georg, I'm wondering, because in Germany, Fukushima had a little bit more of an impact on decision making on the government and locally. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I think I have to correct it a little bit because of, uh, it is always hopeful to hear that uh, everybody is just understood that Fukushima was a core of our decision making for phasing out nuclear. Actually, this was a 20 year long process. But of course, Fukushima at least uh, um, that started the reconsideration process. Um, if a high tech country like uh, Japan, uh, which is really in the top of the uh, industry countries, uh, couldn't manage such a disaster and weren't prepared for that. So there are a lot of things which we might not even know yet. So uh, we may have at risk. We didn't feel that the German um, nuclear plants were not safe, not at all. Uh, but we had alternatives. I think that was the core of the decision. And of course, uh, if you look at the benefits and uh, the, the shortcomings, then clearly uh, nuclear power has a lot of shortcomings and not solved risks. And that was the core of our decision. I would say it was just, you know, the, uh, the last bit of the decision. Sure. And, and it certainly played a role in media. It came up in media a lot in terms of popular conversations around the German energy transition. We'll come in a little bit. Um, hold that thought. Okay, it's about Fukushima. Okay. There's a positive thing in Fukushima. There were three geothermal power plants that had no problem whatsoever. You don't hear about them, they are the solution. Yeah. What you hear about is the old problem. Yeah, and I think that's something we're gonna talk about later, is, is a little bit of what conversations we tend to like in the media as well, whether it's the good stories or, or maybe some of the more depressing ones. Um, but before we get to that, um, we have another little source of inspiration. And don't worry, Jason, I haven't forgotten that either. <laughs> Human activity isn't changing the climate. CO2 is harmless. People can't change the weather. The ice isn't melting. It's just a theory. Climate models are unreliable. Everybody knows scientists are in it for the money. Scientists are like altering their data just to get paid. A scientist will say anything if you pay them. How could germs be real if you can't see them? Gravity is just a theory. Cigarettes aren't addictive. 
The Earth is flat. The sun revolves around the Earth. You can't trust scientists. Of course it's true. I learned it in school. Of course it's true. I learned it in school.
and that is now in the core of our communication. And that is why uh, Germany has a very strong um, as well as efforts in mitigation. Hmm. And Xavier, to come back to, you know, again, working very locally in grassroots and, and through arts, um, what, how would you respond to this question? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's something better than that, uh, and but it is a ritual. And I think it's about doing these ritualistic processes uh, with the Office of Sustainability at Bay County Schools, for instance, for the last four years. Um, every year, every school has taken a green flag and planted a native tree in their school. Um, the green flag is really important because it signals that that used to be wilderness. It's not wilderness anymore, but there was a habitat there before. And they're doing their part through this ritual where they act like Ponce de Leon and they put a flag there and reclaim it back for nature. Other things um, that art can do is make it strange. I think, I think if you make it strange, people will notice. Um, there's a project I've been doing with the Science Museum for almost a decade now, where I take the most common thing on Biscayne Bay, or the thing that should be most common on Biscayne Bay, and that is a floating propagule, floating mangrove seedling. And I put it in artificial life support on windows up and down Lincoln Road, where they used to hang out. But now you've got neon and concrete and glass and Victoria's Secret. <laughs> so we come and we put these huge installations of mangroves and we have them grow there. And people notice, they look at this thing and they think it's bizarre, but it's the most common thing on this sandbar, a mangrove habitat. And by, by making it strange, then you can begin to wrap your head around your relationship to this place. And if you begin to do that, then you start becoming an actor then you're in it as well. Right. So it's about rituals and making it strange, which is kind of what that vampire box is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's perfect. Um, so what we're going to do now is, uh, unfortunately, Jason has to leave us, but we're going to actually transition out. And we have an amazing source of inspiration from Natasha Tsakos, who's going to join us on our second panel. And she is a, a long list of things. So she's a producer and a performance artist and an installation artist and particularly specializes in using uh, different sorts of technology um, like GIS and data mapping and, and many other things to incorporate them into her images and her performances. And what we're going to watch here, and she'll be able to tell you a lot more, I'm sorry if I messed some of that up, um, but we're going to watch her, she actually opened the G20 summit in Mexico City with this performance, and we're going to get to watch that. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street. There's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in a house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel milk and radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. Protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman. I don't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crying in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has been. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I don't want to take this anymore. I want you to get up right now. Get up, go to your windows, open them, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I don't want to take this anymore. Then we'll figure out what to do about the depression and the inflation and the oil prices. Get up, get up, get up. 
I think there's, there's one process that is very intellectual and conceptual, and then, and then you dive into it, and it becomes completely visceral. Um, and I think having to explain anything would demean what happened. Um, okay. You don't have to. No, not for your question later. <laughs> well, you know, I think it was it was a great big example of what we're who's going to introduce our next topic, and you'll see this is actually a, another short film. It's it's a trailer for a film that came out a little while ago about Hurricane Katrina. My name is Scott Michael Roberts. This is my wife Kimberly Roberts. We're New from Orleans. New Orleans, the Night War, underwater. It is a news that is like aiming toward Mississippi, so we might get the Oscar. That's the sky. It looks pretty nice, but it sure soon will change. Girl, I hear some thunder. Golly, look at that water, boy. Lord, please. Oh, let's water. Come and do the wonders. Hey, help us get off the roof, man. You're a real hero, boy. We under siege, truly under siege. Everybody done lost everything around here. Now, you have seen what Katrina has done to us. She stuck us in the attic. I'm running out of juice, too. not been expected yet. It could be dead people right now as we speak. Cause the, the National Guard, they have not been here. And it's two weeks after the hurricane. This is one of the Navy bases that Bush had planned to close down. Why can't we steal the night? What about the women and children? They say, get off our property or we gonna start shooting. We don't need to out here if you try to trouble the water. I don't want to raise your expectations too high. My son wanted to join the army. You're not going to fight for a country that does not give a damn for you. Don't come to our town if you try to throw the water. The hood always be last to be fixed. I'm living life after Katrina. It's hard out here. You going to make it, won't Okay, we all going to make it. Down south, hustling, they going to the water. I got that heat. I urge the citizens to continue to listen to the local authorities. It's our home, our food, our neighbors, our problem. That's where I won't be at. Katrina is still going on. Night walk. So, as I think is, is pointed out rather beautifully there, um, from raw footage from one family during Katrina, is there are a lot of inequities on how climate impacts our communities. And I wonder, um, if you could go to the next slide, how do these inequities of climate impacts really affect our communities as a city or even as a nation? And this is one I pulled up because when talking to a lot of people in Miami, um, something specifically came up an awful lot about housing and housing prices. And I wonder, actually, um, Maggie, could we start with you on that? Because I know you've been working a lot in different communities around Miami. Is you know can, what's happening in terms of, of real estate and well it's it's, it's great that you mentioned that because just this morning I participated in a panel discussion at the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce and I've sat on that committee um, the sustainability committee for the last four years since I started since I was working at Miami Dade County and now in my business I've continued to participate and just today I was. Um, so excited to see uh, 70 uh, business leaders. This is the first time that I've seen such interest in the issue of climate change participate on a panel um, on climate change. And we were talking about just that. We are talking about insurance and real estate and how people are going to be able to afford their homes because um, the insurance companies are not looking um, at, home, at sea level rise as, as a risk. They're not insuring that. So. Um, more and more we'll start seeing these inequities, but also related to affordable housing. Um, I always say that a green home is an affordable home and that our government should make more, um, should make more green housing affordable and make that available to our residents. Uh, because when, you don't, when that resident, that person in that affordable home is, is not spending any money on, on water or energy bills, that, that itself becomes an affordable home. So um, I think that there's a lot of work we need to do with our elected officials, and they are, they, they're, not, they're not paying attention to what the rest of the community right now is really be 
beginning to understand business community, architects, engineers, environmentalists have always known um, that this is happening now. So um, I don't know if that answers the yeah. question, but and, and actually, if you could pass it on to Hugh. Um, Hugh, you've been working a lot. You really know the demographics of South Florida. I've heard through the grapevine incredibly well. And I have up here um, actually a slide that you sent us that really is looking at sea level rise and also looking at prices of housing. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And also um, income. How's, how's that working? Uh, income. Yeah, how, you know, how are our communities here in South Florida being affected differently by climate? Well, I think people are, but um, I'm still reeling from Natasha's <laughs> presentation. I mean, what makes me uninspired. What's made me mad as hell right now is yeah. the fact that you did that, and then the G20 met and had business as usual. Right. Right. And to some extent, the uh, I mean, I've been studying all this stuff about risk and everything else, and which is part of the business as usual. Um, and it's really important, um, uh, but you know, there are kind of two turning points in my life before I sort of get to that question because I think, I mean, prices in real estate have been going on in Florida since the beginning of time, and most people who live here are victims of it. You know, a lot of money gets made more by people outside, but some people here make money. Um, but I did a lot of work on Hurricane Sandy, and um, four days before Sandy in New York City, among, almost all emergency managers knew from simple calculations that there was about a 5% chance that there were areas where people would die if they were there. You know, That's a different kind of risk. I mean, the risk of dying. All these other kinds of risks are, make sense if you're gonna keep playing the game, but if you die, you're not. Um, and then the second thing was, I was I spoke at an event that Javier, Javier organized for Earth Day in Miami Beach, and it kind of came to me that really I want to go back to be a scientist who kind of responds to nature like your art um, does with nature. And one of the sort of good things, I guess, about being on the front line in South Florida is you know, we really are facing questions of whether our community's gonna die. Our ecosystems, some of them are dying or have died already in the Keys. Um, you know, so we're facing that question and to some extent, I mean, when somebody told me that I was not gonna ever be able to sell my house and I should enjoy it, I thought, well, at my age, I want to be part of nature in this whole thing, you know, and fight like hell and get as mad as hell yeah. and, and stop being so rational about all these things. And, and Natasha, I wonder, speaking of mad as hell, I'm, not that you are, but <laughs> that was certainly um, a very powerful part of the performance we saw, and, and you do so many different performances, and I wonder, um, how have you seen different audiences react in terms of if we're looking at inequities, um, you know, have, have different communities at the G20 versus working in the local area. Have, have people reacted differently? No. <laughs> I ask the no, yes or no question. That's like the death of questions, right? Yeah. I think people <laughs> all realized and were shocked or moved or uh, provoked. But what's interesting about your question, and you just made me realize it, is that obviously it didn't provoke enough to uh, really make a change, which shouldn't have happened. Um, and, and so I, I have one more challenge, you know, and it, it's, that's, that's, I think that's really the next step, is, is how do you create something that is, that touches people, that is ritualistic, uh, that is strange, um, um, and at the same time that really, really changes. And I, personally, and I, I'm kind of going off the topic here, but I think the green movement has not been, well, one should feel some, like something, it's complete, it should be natural, it's, it's about respect. It's about respecting yourself, respecting the other person, and respecting the environment you live in. And if you don't respect one or the other, there's no ecology, right? Uh, 
and then the other thing is, I think, it's, it's really striking to me to see that there's so many brilliant artists and brilliant minds and brilliant advertisers, and, and they can sell us the, mo the most poisonous things, right? Mm. But I, something I may even like. But why is it that we're not applying that, that psychology and, and that, that art? And why can't we brand it differently? I think uh, being green, it's so boring. It's, not, it's just not being embraced enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's, it's really, again, about just respecting. And, and something that's come up to bring it back to inequities too is an awful lot of our communities, when we look at the environmental movement, it's not super diverse, um, whether it's economically or, or race or um, background. But that's not always true. And I wonder if we could come back to you one more time. How do we, how do we broaden the conversation? How do we reduce some of these inequities, at least in terms of information and outreach and inspiration? This is my own opinion. But it's not diverse because those who have been talking about it haven't expanded their message beyond the people who believe in what they believe. And that's great that you um, strengthen numbers, right? But they've had a hard time communicating the message. I'm, I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not um, an engineer. I'm not, I'm not any of those professions. I'm just a public servant who cares about my community. And I talk about this all the time because this is really about quality of life. This is what type of life, what type of life do you want to have? Do you want one with polluted air? Do you want one with um, crime, with long response times for fire, with flooding due to non-rain events? And I think that that's where we need to go next in terms of reaching out to uh, the community. And, and something that's really exciting that's happening now, um, I'm, I'm out there a lot with different types of organizations, is that all these different types of organizations, uh, realtors, in, insurance agents, architects, engineers, environmentalists, um, just kids who care, millennials, they're actually all talking about this right now. So I really feel as if um, we're just starting to, to have the water boil and, and bubble. And pretty soon, really, we're all, I think that the community is really going to push the agenda forward for our elected officials to really pay attention. And that is a perfect segue, we'll see in a minute. Um, to speaking of water boiling and elected officials, take a look at this. The science is clear that man-made emissions of air pollution and global warming gases are changing global warming our atmosphere. It's still an issue that the scientists are still debating and you know it and I know it. The debate on the causes of climate change are far from settled. Well, the climate's always changing. That's not the fundamental question. The fundamental question is whether man-made activity is, the, is what's contributing most to it. I understand that people say there's a significant scientific consensus on that issue, but I've actually seen reasonable debate on that, per, on that principle. You look at this last year, it was the warmest uh, year in the last decade, I think was the, the numbers that came out. I don't, uh, I accept that. I, I do not say that it is man-made. I don't think CO2 is a problem, and therefore I don't think it needs to be regulated. We all breathe CO2, uh, climate changes, but there's no uh, evidence at all that it's man-made CO2 that causes the climate to change. It's almost comical. Every time we exhale, we exhale carbon dioxide. Uh, every cow in the world, uh, you know, when they do what they do, you've got more carbon dioxide. It could be secular. It could be just a shift on the axis. The ice caps are melting, which we see over and over again. Yeah, they're melting on Mars, too. I'd like to have somebody look at the lesser optimum, which is a little closer in time, and how much did the temperature rise then? We know that that led to the Vikings dominating uh, Europe for several hundred years. The idea of human-induced global climate change is one of the greatest hoaxes perpetrated out of the scientific community. It is a hoax. We can choose to believe that Superstorm Sandy and, and the most severe drought in decades, 
and the worst wildfires some states have ever seen were all just a freak coincidence. Or we can choose to believe in the overwhelming judgment of science and act before it's too late. Sandy, Ivan, Katrina. Since 1954, the World Meteorological Organization has been naming hurricanes and tropical storms. But what did these people do to deserve having their names attached to this? As climate change continues to create more frequent and devastating storms, we propose a new naming system. One that names extreme storms after policymakers who deny climate change. We propose something like this. Senator Marco Rubio is expected to pound the eastern seaboard sometime early tonight. Windows are being boarded up and grocery stores are virtually empty as Marco Rubio threatens everything in his path. Now, Michelle Bachman is on the way, folks, and specifically the eye of Michelle Bachman will be hitting Florida in a few hours. Congresswoman Michelle Bachman is incredibly dangerous. If you value your life, please seek shelter from Michelle Bachman. Senator David Vitter is turning out to be one of the hugest and costliest disasters in American history. David Vitter is literally lifting boats out of the water and tossing them onto the land. In New Orleans, the levees that were built to stop Hurricane Colin Peterson have been obliterated. I'm here at the North Pier where Speaker John Boehner is really doing a number on 
this coastline. John Boehner is just destroying this town. Local animal shelters are under pressure as thousands of animals have been displaced or killed by Governor Rick Perry. We can't even take care of the animals that we've rescued, and so some of them are going to have to be put down, all because of Rick Perry. We've been here for two days because of Congressman Paul Ryan. I have friends still out there. It's scary because I have no idea what Paul Ryan could be doing to them right now. Senator James Inhofe has turned out to be a worst-case scenario come true. And now an entire nation is wondering how they'll ever recover from the disaster that is James Inhofe. If you agree that it's time for a naming system that names extreme storms caused by climate change after policymakers who deny climate change, sign the petition at climatenamechange.org before John Boehner blows your entire city away. Uh, elections are nonpartisan. 
Um, so uh, you don't really see Democrats versus Republicans. But um, what, what you see, though, is counties that in the past um, were competing against each other coming together. In fact, right now we have the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compact, which is um, four uh, neighboring counties um, that have come together, Broward, Palm Beach, Miami-Dade, and Monroe, to um, deal with issues of climate change and, again, strengthen numbers. And what they have done is they've been able to, um, together, collaboratively, come up with a climate change action plan for Southeast Florida. So those types of relationships are developing, but um, we're still part of the compact. We still have staff. I talk about it as if I'm still part of the county, but I do live in Miami County, so this is what I care about. Um, uh, our staff does still participate, and we still do have a climate action plan. Um, but those are the types of, of relationships that I see developing, and also with different types of organizations as well, um, collaborative, co collaboratively having events to educate their members on, um, uh, on climate change. For example, recently I sat in a panel discussion for a, a community development a coalition, and it was about climate change. Yeah. So typically you wouldn't have uh, developers or people who are interested in economic development talk about climate change, yeah. but they're talking about it now. So, so there are ways that it's reaching outside of the quote unquote environmental groups. And yes, Well, one of the things that we're seeing is that the climate change compact has actually expanded to become 750, which is a somewhat different movement, which is more economically driven. And probably the only way to bring people together is shared economic interests, as well as shared threats. Here we have both. So it is a kind of a broad tent, and there are people of many stripes who are getting involved. And frankly, being a climate change denier is pretty soon going to exclude people from office, and I think a lot of people are starting to get that. Great. So that's a really good segue. We're actually, so we've reached that end of our two separate panels, and what we're going to do now, you guys all have a sheet of paper and a pen on your chair when you sat down, is we're going to come and do something. Did you all know you came here to do climate speed dating? So we're going to use some of the resources in the room, because there are many different people here. And then um, we're, we're going to take about 10 minutes, and we're going to ask you to try to talk to as many people as possible around you that you don't know. Um, and to try to answer particularly the resources question on one page is what are some resources you know that can be used to address climate change here in Miami? So it could be very local, like there's this amazing community garden in you know, a certain place where they do free classes. Or it could be very big about ways to reach our politicians. So you can think very creatively, but try to, you're going to get Two minutes per conversation, and I'm going to yell out switch, all right? And then we'll come back, and we'll have the last bit, which is really looking forward. What is really possible here to address climate? And then there'll be drinks, so you definitely don't want to leave. Um, so we're going to, you're going to get a chance to stretch your legs, turn around, and talk to someone behind you, yes? The restroom is right out that door, too, straight ahead. And then, um, so we have 10 minutes, so you're trying to talk to as many people as possible, but you have maximum two minutes per person. Try to fill out your sheet as much as possible. And on your mark, get set, go. And choreographer. And Becca, we welcome you. Would you like the lights?
we're going to look at um, ones that are unsettled. All right. All right. I can steer to over a little more, so Natasha, you're still in the frame. Are we good? Okay. Are you even?
here for a very, very, very long time. And now we're starting to look at our city differently and start, we're starting to, in our urban areas, starting to identify places where we need connectivity, where we need parks, where we need places of community. And um, in that respect, um, the millennials that live here have been very, very um, important and key to that conversation really um, happening and developing here. So I'm grateful to them. Great. And before we go on, I just want to give an opportunity. You two both also living in this area. Do either of you have something you want to ask that hasn't been said about what you see the future? I feel like a massive pessimist right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess what, someone has to play the role, but I do not feel nearly as optimistic as you guys do. Um, I'm, I have, you know, fears about what the community, will, what who will be able to pay for and withstand the type of uh, impacts that I think sea level rise is going to bring to us. And, you know, I don't see the type of radical action that I think is necessary now, today, I mean, immediately to start to deal with the severity of what's going to happen.